tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, greetings, everyone, and welcome uh, to today's session on Shine on Diamond Journals, making sure they're forever. Um, I'm really pleased to be chairing uh, the start of today's session. My name is Michelle Blake, and I'm the University Librarian here at Whare Wānanga o Waikato, the University of Waikato in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, I just wanted to, to start today by just doing an acknowledgement of our country. Um, so this is um, the acknowledgement of country uh, for um, Australia, where our Open Access Australasian colleagues are based. Um, so we'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past, present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, Open, Ex oh, sorry, Open Access Australasia recognises the Turbul and Yugara Bedigal um, Yugan, I should have, I'm, I apologise, I'm actually not sure how to pronounce some of these because I'm not from Australia, so I apologise and I would rather not butcher um, uh, the name, so I would just leave people to read the ones that I'm unable to pronounce, but we would like to recognise all of the First Nations owners of the land where we work. Uh, we also pay our respects to all Indigenous peoples wherever they are in the world, including Ngā Iwi Māori, the Tangata Whenua of Aotearoa, New Zealand. And what I would um, encourage you to do is in the chat, if you would like to acknowledge where you are today, that would be fantastic. And it's always great to see where um, people are, are coming in from and recognising the land on which um, uh, you, you are um, sitting. Um, so... I'm just going to um, let you know that the session is being recorded today and that recording will be made available um, later um, to access on the Open Australasia website. Uh, we also do have just a little bit of housekeeping. So um, I think um, I'm safe to say that everyone is probably already muted with your microphone um, off, but please also you can turn your camera off as well. Um, you're also welcome to type questions into Slido via the link that we'll share in a minute um, or in the chat. Um, and if we have time at the end, those questions will be put to our panellists as well. So um, the other thing I just want to let you know is that this session is also part of the Global Summit on Diamond Open Access as well, which is taking place at the moment. And I think some of us uh, panellists will talk a little bit about that as well. So without further ado, I'm just going to um, introduce our panellists um, and then invite them um, just to say briefly uh, their, their kind of work in Diamond Open Access journals as well. So um, first we have uh, Johan Rorik, who is the Executive Director of Coalition S, uh, Co-Editor-in-Chief of Diamond Access Journal, uh, Glossa, the co-PI on the Dimas project and visiting professor at Leiden University. Johan, if I just ask you to, to briefly talk about um, uh, your involvement with Diamond. Um, my, my involvement in Diamond in general or, um, yes. Yeah. So my, my involvement in, in Diamond, of course, predates my um, work at Coalition S. Um, it, it, in 2015, uh, we uh, flipped the uh, Elsevier journal, Lingua, to, to Glossa, uh, Diamond Open Access Journal. And so that was something that we was prepared for a few years, of course. So, And by doing so, we, uh, we as a community, learned a lot about uh, what it takes to take a journal to Diamond Open Access, because you suddenly become responsible for the journal in a way that you weren't before. And so basically you have to invent all sorts of all sorts of things and in addition to uh, making the journal sustainable. I mean, the sustainable part is, of course, the hard part, but you also have to think in terms of governance. Uh, you have to think in terms of sustainability of governance. Well, what happens if, uh, you know, an accident happens to me as the executive, ed as the, uh, executive editor? Is there someone or is there a process that allows the, the community to, to find a different... Uh, a different uh, um, editor, uh, that, that those those are the kind of things you need to think about uh, in a in a, when when you run a diamond uh, open access journal. And one of the things we found, of course, is that there is very little, at least in Europe, there was very little support for this this type this type of thing. So that's one of the reasons why 
I then started to think about, you know, ways of organizing that. Uh, we were part also of the Open Library of Humanities, which was a community of journals already. It's a relatively small community, 30 journals. And then, of course, over the over the years, uh, I came into contact, uh, certainly by Coalition S as well, came into contact with the Dalika America. I was already here in 2019. I'm very happy to be back. So I became director of Coalition S also because I thought that um, the, the diamond community needed to be represented in uh, the Plan S and in Coalition S. That was one of the reasons to do that. And in fact, that 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 commitment has has played out because I mean we are now playing much paying much more attention to diamond open access because the conversation about open access has evolved. Um, you know, from the initial thought that we that the funders had that they that there would be this this transition that this transition was something that they could do via uh, via by influencing existing commercial publishers that 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 has not panned out in the way that well, and so now we are turning more towards diamond open access solutions and to solutions that deliver open access even even more fast but that are all rooted in the scholarly communities thank so, you Johan. thank you so thank you um, I'll uh, move on to introducing Ariana uh, Becerra Garcia, the Executive Director of Redelic, um, Professor of Autonomous University of the State of Mexico and Universities Allied for Essential Medicines and Chair of Amelica. <clears throat> Apologies if I've uh, butchered any of that, Ariana, but if you'd just like to just give a little brief um, outline of your work with Diamond OA Journals, that would be great. Thank you, Michele. Um, well, um, as you said, I'm heading uh, Redelica and Amelica Initiatives. Well, Redelica is an open infrastructure that holds around 1,600 uh, journals in full text diamond. All, all journals are diamond. We started 20 years ago as a platform to give visibility to uh, journals and help journals to transition to the digital uh, space. But now, uh, as uh, Johan said, the uh, open access evolved, also the needs of journals evolved. And uh, from uh, 2018, we, uh, we are focusing to exclusively provide services to diamond open access journals in order to uh, prevent the adoption of APC practices here in Latin America. Uh, you probably are familiar with the uh, the the ecosystem that it has been in or the tradition let's say in, in Latin America that we have uh, uh, hundreds of journals that are run by universities and uh, uh, academic associations as well that are well supported by uh, with public funds and they, they are uh, in hands of the academics uh, so it is um, a very vibrant community of researchers doing journals that are providing a universal benefit with no fees, uh, neither for authors nor for readers. So uh, we were, uh, we have been doing open access before the, the name of open access was coined. And, and in that sense, Redalic is providing uh, added value services to the Diamond Open Access journals that need other uh, features or and functionalities in order to help them to to reach um, more uh, visibility, more uh, uh, discoverability capacities, also metrics, also uh, well workflow tools in order to help them to be more sustainable and more efficient. So we are uh, providing this kind of services, of course, for free. And um, and we work with the Amelica Initiative together with other institutions. And uh, it, this initiative is also led uh, by UNESCO and CLACSO. Uh, and we are uh, trying to extrapolate the Diamond um, Open Access Publishing uh, paradigm to the open science. So we uh, have different developments in order to, to take the paradigm of science as a global public good to the open science and to involve uh, a book books publishing and also policies, mandates, open data, and other initiatives that are part of the open science spectrum uh, with the paradigm of science as a public good, which is the, the flag and also the, the, the vision that readily calls uh, to help join us to, to, be, to advance. Thank you very much. I'll move on to Sean Ong, who is a distinguished professor at James Cook University and director of the ARC Center of Excellence for Indigenous and Environmental Histories and Futures. So over to you, Sean. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and I have to start by saying my experience of diamond open access is much more modest than Johan's or Ariana's. Uh, but I've always had a really strong passion for 
supporting and championing uh, scholarly led journals. And for the past 12 years, I've been the editor in chief uh, of the Diamond Open Access Journal, Queensland Archaeological Research, uh, which we flipped from a traditional uh, subscription based model uh, back in 2011. Uh, it was originally hosted at the University of Queensland, but now it's hosted at James Cook University. And it's really at that end of the spectrum being a small thematic journal that's very data rich and aimed at making uh, research results available to First Nations communities and cultural heritage practitioners. So very much focused in that space. Uh, in With other hats, I'm also involved in non-diamond open access journals. So. Um, I have a, uh, some pretty strong views on different aspects of the publishing spectrum from those experiences. Thank you so much, Sean. And, and certainly last but certainly not least is Donna Coventry, who's a scholarly communications coordinator and research services at Te Matapuna, the Library and Learning Services at Auckland University of Technology. Over to you, Donna. Oh, thanks. I kia ora. I'm Donna Coventry and um, yeah, I'm the scholarly communications coordinator at AUT University in, um, in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, so I work with Open Research, uh, Open Access Research Platform Tuwhera. Um, Tuwhera is a te reo Māori word uh, with multiple meanings, but it means to be open or opening up. And um, we believe that knowledge exists for the benefit of the communities from which it comes. So that's the belief behind our platform. Um, the platform was established in 2016 and hosts over 20 diamond journals plus other open access resources including our repository um, and these the journals we have are edited or associated with staff at our institution um, our team works with editors on establishing their journals uh, troubleshooting we teach them how to use open journal systems ojs which is what we use um, teach them about metadata uh, discoverability establishing credibility uh, our journals range from very brand new journals. In fact, we've got one to come out probably later or probably next week for the first issue ever. And um, we have also journals that have been around for over 20 years um, that may have started on another platform, but um, have moved to ours. And, and a couple, well, one that we have from Wiley that we've managed to turn to Diamond Open Access. Thank you so much, Donna. Um, so I'm just going to start with some of the, the questions that we have for our panellists. And I'm, Sean, I'm going to start um, with you for the first question, which is around what the main challenges that you have faced in running or advocating for Diamond Open Access Journals are. Thanks, Michelle. And uh, look, I am sure I am not alone in saying this, but for me, the key challenges revolve around continuity and capacity of institutional support. And I, it's something I hear a lot from uh, Diamond Open Access journal editors and support staff around the world. And I think too, too often uh, the support for Diamond Open Access journals is based on sympathetic individuals within organisations, whether they're uh, in libraries or technical support. And when those sympathetic individuals leave the institution or are uh, uh, you know, their role is uh, changed. It makes diamond open access platforms at many institutions with minimal investments very, very vulnerable. Um, and I think it's a key threat to sustainability. Another aspect of that uh, capability is in resourcing. And um, uh, preparing for this session, I was reassured that most diamond open access journals like ours run on the smell of an oily rag that most of the indirect costs are, are absorbed by volunteer labour. And we all know that, you know, most of the costs are about labour and the scholarly community and libraries uh, go up, you know, often in universities go above and beyond to provide that. But there are some direct costs. And uh, in my own experience, one of those was cross-reference fees for minting uh, digital object identifiers. And for a small journal, it's not, not a large cost, but you know, obviously very important in the domains we work in. Uh, and for the first few years, I paid those fees personally until I could convince the institution to uh, pick up that very modest fee. But again, every year, that's an argument I have to make for who will pay those very modest fees. So 
uh, I think those sorts of lobbying demands we all have to make just to keep these journals sustainable make it quite emotionally intensive adding on to our workloads. Um, and, you know, I know other universities have different experiences with different investments, but I think the majority of Diamond Open Access journals are really running with very little institutional support and really relying on the goodwill of those involved. I can see lots of nods from the other panelists here. Would anyone else like to comment on this? Johan? Yes, I can gladly comment on that. In in, in Europe, we have well, we organized a, a study um, in two thousand twenty one. It came out the Open Access Diamond Journal study that that actually. Um, that actually uh, Red Alica America also participated in. Um, this was a study that was run for a year, and the, the results clearly showed this, that in fact, uh, if you look at Diamond Open Access Journals, they constitute an, a, a fragmented archipelago of individual journals that really don't talk to each other, that don't share resources, that don't share uh, infrastructures, uh, except in certain cases, of course, right? I mean, you. you but th then again, I mean, you know, Red Alica America is 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 a regional exception in a way, rather than uh, well, while it should be the rule. Um, we also found in the our recent Diama study that in fact in certain countries there is some coordination and that there things are really run relatively well. In in Europe, that is Spain because you know a funder did the work there. By contrast, in Finland, it's the, the, those, those 200 journals in Finland are, are run by scholarly societies uh, funded by the government. And again, things are running run well. In Croatia, there's still a different solution. And in France, you have open edition. But all the other countries in Europe don't have at the national level these kinds of these kinds of resources. And, and, and I think that would be really helpful, you know, to to have this kind of infrastructure at the national at the national level, maybe also at the level of the institution or the university, if the university is, is, is large enough or wants to collaborate on that. But certainly at the national level, there should be uh, an infrastructure that helps journals with issues like sustainability, like, you know, providing DOIs, uh, the the, the, there just needs to be much more infrastructure. Because, and, and this is not something that editors should do. Editors should simply be involved with, you know, the governance of their journal, the editing of their journal, and making sure that the, 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 the articles of, are of good quality. They should not be running around thinking about the money <laughs> to run their journals. That's that's the way I see I see things. And and that is just not happening yet. That that's also why we want to 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 create uh, in Europe at least a uh, uh, an, an open access diamond hub, very similar to to what Redalik is doing, uh, to provide this and in a federated way, so that you also have national hubs that do this work, because of course you need that to be acquainted with the legislation in that country, and and then have you know the smaller the small entities at various universities that 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 service those journals as well. So it it would be a very well distributed network, but but a network nevertheless where at every level you have different kinds of responsibilities. That and and if I understand Ariana, that is also the way Redalic works. They also have national hubs and and those that are closer to the to the journals of those of those national national entities. So that's what we need to build, and and I think we need to build it in a worldwide fashion. We need also, I think, a diamond. A global diamond federation that that unites all these efforts. Um, we, I mean, if we are to succeed, we need to do this on a global level, so that we can really also be a force alongside the commercial publishers that also function globally. That 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 should be the goal, I believe. Thank you, Johan. Sorry. Ariana. I wondered if you might want to <laughs> come come in on this um, and talk more about you know what you do have in place. Yes, I just, yes, thank you. Uh, I would like to add that, uh, yes, I see the Diamond uh, Open Access that uh, needs different stakeholders and agents and players in order to, to thrive. I mean, uh, this is a clear role for open infrastructures to add value to the Diamond Open Access ecosystem. And this is something I think uh, we need to, to, to think very seriously how open infrastructure can are, are part of the ecosystem. Together with, uh, of course, policies and mandates, we need uh, Diamond Open Access to be considered in our research system, incentives systems in, in order to 
uh, endorse the, the quality and to uh, promote and, and to contribute that uh, this myth that diamond open access is not quality, diamond open access is a, like a secondary alternative. It is not really, but we need the, also uh, decision makers that recognize, recognize that. Uh, so to help also funders to, to 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 be part of that recognition, and also I think it's a very interesting and um, important uh, collaboration uh, or uh, important potential from the collaboration with Green Green uh, Root of Open Access because uh, in in Latin America, for example, we have a very interesting um, experience and, and very good results from the collaboration with the regional. A network of institutional repositories, which is La Referencia. So we are working together in order to, to take uh, back the, the content that it, it's been published in Diamond Journals, take it back to the community that generated it. And this is something that uh, we cannot have from other uh, routes of open access or for uh, from commercial uh, models of open access. We don't have that possibility to take the content, content back uh, in an easy way uh, to the to the repository, so it is something that it's been uh, very useful to work together with this uh, with this route in order to have a more healthy ecosystem. So we need to really think on various uh, different stakeholders and players to really help Diamond to succeed. Yes. Thanks so much, Ariana. Um, Donna, I just wanted to see if there was anything you wanted to, to add to this. I'm sure uh, some of what Sean spoke about will be very familiar to, to you as well. Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, I mean, one challenge we have is we don't have much of a shared infrastructure. Uh, we don't have a national open access database. Um, we have one funder with an open access policy. Um, so it's a real challenge to get our, our journals out there. And I just wanted to add that um, one of the challenges we have is to establish a new journal as a legitimate journal without all these platforms to have it, boost it from, I suppose. Um, but not when we have a new journal, it's not indexed anywhere. Um, and they need to prove their credibility, but they need to attract authors to get that credibility. And so it's a bit of a cycle. Um, so if we had... Um, so, like they're not on they're not going to get on directory of open access journals it's going to take a couple of years to get on scopus if that's what they want and so having some sort of infrastructure where you can access these journals and say say to your researchers oh look if you go here you'll find some really good journals that are, are community local journals so yes exactly what everyone else has said <laughs> Thanks so much, Donna. I'll move us on to the next question. And Johan, I'll, I'll start with you this time, if I may. Um, so have you seen, um, and, and some of you kind of touched upon some of this and, and your answers to the last question, but I just wanted to, to ask you about what you've noticed with attitudes changing over time that you've been involved with the, the Diamond Open Access Journals and what you think might have driven some of those changes. There's, yes, I, I think things are changing very, very, very rapidly, actually. I mean, since since the, in the last three years, I've seen more change than the last, than, than in the 10 years before that, in regarding Diamond Open Access. And, and I mean that when, you know, the, the, the Diamond Open Access Journal study came out, then we were happy to have that study, but then um, you know, very quickly there was a follow up on that, and there were the, the Amas projects, the Craft Away projects, that are European projects to to uh, to investigate the state of uh, diamond open access. We launched the diamond diamond action plan, which was uh, um, you know endorsed by 160 organizations. Uh, so there was a real interest there in in, in diamond open access that, that that was then finally confirmed in May 2023 by the EU Council conclusions, uh, which stated actually that there needed to be more attention for not-for-profit publishing, which is a code, of course, for diamond open access publishing, and also that the fee, that it would that there should not be fees for authors or readers, which is again code, of course, for the for the definition of diamond open access. So EU Council conclusions really mean that we ha now have support at the highest political level in Europe. And if you had told me three years ago that, that would be the case, I would have laughed at you, really. I mean, this was really completely unexpected. So things have been evolving extremely rapidly, which all will also means that we need to rise to the challenge, right? We need, we need, to, in, we need to make sure that we 
create the infrastructures and the legal structures that are necessary to build these national capacity hubs, these, uh, these, these, this European capacity hub, and to also extend that to other uh, regions in the world. I mean, you see capacity problems everywhere. Problems in uh, problems in in Africa where, where they tell us you know we have this many journals but we could easily take on uh, the same amount if we if we only had the money. You hear this, but you hear the same in Europe. You know all the capacity. Uh, you know people can take on much more journals than they have to say no to journals simply because they don't have the capacity. So this all of this needs to change, and I think it's a good moment. I think things have changed. There's also the realization I think that. If we continue on this model of transformative agreements on the one hand and APCs on the other, uh, the agreement at certainly with funders, both in, 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 in various countries in Europe, is that we cannot go on like this. In France, for instance, they calculated that if they continue on this path with APCs, in 10 years, they would be paying three times what they're paying now. Uh, look at also at, you know, the the what 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 is reported reported by MDPI, a publisher, that, as you know, and uh, and Frontiers. Together, for instance, last year, they raked in $1 billion in revenues. So that tells you, I mean, that $1 billion of revenues comes from somewhere, right? I mean, it's, and, and it, this is simply unsustainable. And th that realization that, you know, that we cannot leave this simply to commercial publishing, who in exchange for a fixed APC do not want to tell us what is in there in terms of services, um, have a single APC for, for everyone in the world, whether you are a researcher in New Delhi or a researcher in Toluca, Mexico, it's one price. It's completely inequitable. It's completely unaffordable. It's completely untransparent. We, we, we can't have that. So we have to take back the initiative of academic publishing. We have no choice. And I think that realization is slowly dawning in not only with funders in Europe, but also at universities, at the ministries, at various levels, there is there's really this realization, hey, if we go on, on this path, we are completely, we, we will simply not have the money to sustain this system. So we need to find something else, take back the initiative and build an alternative. Thanks, yeah. Sorry. Um, no, 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 not at all. No, really, really interesting. And and Donna, I, I wondered if if you might want to to come in on this as a almost as quite a local kind of diamond. And I'm just curious because you you talked about your newest journal is just you know coming now, but you've had journals that are around 20 years old. And and what have you seen, um, you know, in your time working working with um, uh, you know, AUT. But, um, I really had a good think about like, what, what attitudes are. And um, so in 2016, we hosted two very traditional um, journals, Diamond Open Access Journals, and uh, now we host over 20. And um, reasons given to us by editors is um, they want to establish journals to reach out to practitioners. They want to provide a supportive space for their postgraduate students. They want to meet gaps in the published research, especially in areas of Pacific, where there's not much research out there. Um, creating accessible research to communities and the freedom to be um, to embrace more innovation. And um, that's one area that I've, I've seen changes that people are getting a bit more adventurous in what their journals are, and they don't have to be the, the very traditional Western model of a journal. Um, but we have one that publishes research summaries for practitioners. We've got a journal that is going to publish future research so people can give their feedback on the research um, and give ideas before it's actually published. Um, and we've even got a postgraduate journal where students learn to peer review and how to be an editor. And then yesterday at um, Michelle's webinar at Waikato University, we had some of the um, academics from Waikato University speaking about their journals and one is um, called In Our Language, which takes existing research and publishes it in Pacific languages um, for people to read that. And I, I was really blown away by that. I thought it was a great idea. And so I, I see these attitudes changed towards being a bit more adventurous, and that's great. But at the same time, we still come across the same attitudes of um, well, misbelief set publisher impact is the prestige they want and as much as we say that the sport community um it's the beliefs ingrained in our publishing culture and um yeah so 
hopefully we can work on that. But for now, I've, it has definitely improved in the years I've been, been working with open access. I think there's a real tension, isn't there, between um, what a lot of us face globally around things like rankings and metrics and, and needing to almost play that game with what we might want to do that seems the best thing to do for, for ourselves and for our communities. Um, and that came out really strongly um, from Indigenous um, uh, researchers here at Waikato most definitely. Sean or Ariana, would you like to add anything to, to this question? Yes, well, I, I'm sorry, Shan, sorry, this is Shan, no, please go first. I, just just quickly, I just wanted to comment, um, you know, I think in Australia, attitudes are very fluid. Some institutions have stepped away and, and stopped supporting diamond open access platforms, sometimes citing cybersecurity concerns and other things. Other institutions have, have invested from a, a very low base. But just wanted to pick up on something Johan uh, commented on about the flow of capital um, supporting traditional publishing models that um, I, I engage you know, with a lot of senior scholars in my work as a research manager. And one of the attitudinal changes I've noticed with read and publish agreements is that many researchers who don't engage with open access assume now that every journal is free to publish in. So, it's actually muddied the water about differentiating that flow of capital. And I think there's work to do for us as a community in, in educating researchers who, who are actually the, you know, finding the money to, to maintain this flow of global capital um, and getting them to, to be activists in their own right in being more discerning about how they support those traditional publishing models and hamper changes in this area to more equitable formats. Ariana, did you want to come in as well? I just want to add to the comment uh, about the uh, indigenous knowledge that uh, I just want to highlight uh, the contribution of Diamond Open Access Journals in, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, they allow uh, naturally to, to uh, a diverse, ecosystem of, of journals. So in the case or in the experience uh, of Red Alix, for example, we have seen that uh, uh, was there's no uh, market rules involved in the in creating journals and allowing journals to be alive, then it, it can uh, be an organic way to to a journal to, to emerge. I mean communities that are working together in a research or in a in a community then they think on creating a journal and then the journal emerge. So Diamond, Diamond uh, Open Access really enables diversity in that sense and in a very organic way. So I just want to add that. Thank you so much, Ariana. And I'm about to come back to you as well for, for the, our next question, if I may. And again, we, we've started to touch on this in terms of uh, what we might need to see change. Um, in terms of driving that that kind of regional change for diamond open access. So I wondered if you might um, start by talking about who are those kind of key groups and people um, that you see as being um, pivotal to, to making those changes or who have already helped make the changes where you are. Are you okay? okay. Sorry, did you hear that Ariana? Sorry. I have an interruption with the uh, internet. Sorry about that. That's okay. Did you did you hear the question, or do you need me to repeat it? Would you please yeah. repeat it? Yeah, yes. no worries. Um, so we've we've talked a little bit about what might need to change. So just thinking about where you're based and the in the region that you're based in, who are those kind of key groups or people that need to be involved towards driving that change, or who have already helped to drive it where you are? Sure. Uh, first, I think it is, it is important to notice that in Latin America, we have the need to preserve something that it's already done. We already have a, a strong diamond ecosystem, so we need to preserve it from different uh, threats that are coming from the commercial sector. Uh, and I know that in other regions, they try to move away from this dependence with a, with a gold open access, but this is not our case. So in, in our case, we need... Uh, 
uh, the different stakeholders to support what it, it already exists. For example, governments, funders that recognize uh, diamond open access journals, as I said before, in the research systems and mandates, but also we need resources to be uh, to be invested in um, in 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 the infrastructure that supports a uh, diamond open access within universities, within uh, academic institutions, and also we need libraries on board. It's a key player in diamond open access in in various directions. Uh, first, for example, in the not only in the sustainability, but also to take the content uh, that is published in diamond to take it closer to the research community and also to the students community, to the new generation. So to be part of the discoverability solutions, to be part of you know the library's uh, daily work. So uh, we need libraries to, to, to already uh, to, to help uh, Diamond Journals. And also we need uh, journal editors that are uh, already engaged to uh, perhaps making a journal but to, to be part of a broader community that share practices, that share uh, common things, technology, uh, that, uh, that can use infrastructures to help them to, to be a, a more uh, cohesive community. And also, well, as I said, uh, researchers and students, if we don't involve the research community and, uh, and new generations, I think it's gonna be difficult for them to to break this inertia that we already have because the industry of prestige, you know, it's very, it's embedded in the system and we need to change some inertias that are uh, currently happening in the, in the researchers community and also with a, with a new generation researcher uh, researcher. So we need to also work with them to, to let them know that, uh, that uh, prestige uh, doesn't mean quality. It's not equal that, uh, that uh, uh, the, the sustainability uh, uh, or the business model of a journal doesn't mean that you will have uh, perhaps more uh, visibility or more impact or more internationalization if you pay for APC, for example. So to deconstruct some of the myths that are kind of affecting the way researchers and the community see Diamond. So we need, I think we need all to be on board to, to really help um, Diamond, yes. Thank you so much, Ariana. Sean, I wondered if um, you might want to come in because you started to talk about some of the educative piece with researchers, and I'm, I'm sure you've got other thoughts you might want to share on this. Yeah, look, I mean, this is very much coming from my own experience, but what I really value about Diamond Open Access Journals is that diversity that Ariana referred to, that I, I think, you know, the, the real heart of them are those scholarly communities of practice that are formed around the journals and um you know at the moment a lot of these are very small small scale and local in focus and I wanted to pick on up on something donna mentioned about establishing the credibility of journals that i think some of the older more prestigious universities uh, are suspicious about the credibility of diamond open access journals and you know, very much see them as self, you know, I've even heard this from academic quality people that they're self-published venues when academics publish in a diamond open access journal hosted by their universities. And, you know, of course, in promotion and grant rounds and things, some countries, including Australia, are very traditional in their conventional assessment of uh, uh, Q1 journals, et cetera, in very traditional ways. And, I think senior uh, researchers and publishers can challenge those sorts of models through their own practice and by role modeling. But you know, at the moment, it's very difficult for me to advise an early career researcher not to seek to publish in those high profile journals because their future career is still linked to that. So there's a nexus there we have to uh, we have to break. Look, I think the the second trend I see in Australia, um, is institutional libraries in particular really showing a lot of leadership in this space? And I think they're real agents for change, but it worries me the amount of capital tied up in budgets supporting read and publish agreements, which, you know, uh, in Australia, institutional budgets, particularly library budgets, are under a lot of pressure 
which makes it very difficult and in this environment for libraries to allocate resources to, to new initiatives. And I think that's a real barrier. Thanks so much, Sean. Johan or Donna, do you want to come in on this? Yes, I, I, I'm sorry, Donna. Yeah, well, uh, yes, I, I think that's true. I think a lot of the money is just tied up in very expensive read and publish agreements. Um, um, and, and, and very often, actually, even when there is no read and publish agreement, the money is not repurposed for new initiatives. This, this is what happened in, in Germany, for instance. In Germany, for several years, I didn't have a deal with Elsevier. That money just dripped away to parking lots and other laboratories, you know, in the university that was not re 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 repurposed. At least in France, they, they, they made the... The, the decision to, to to use the money that was saved on on a deal with Elsevier to invest to invest in in Diamond Open Access, and and that is of course good, right? I mean, you could you could very easily go without a deal with with one of the bigger publishers. And I often say, you know, if you for three or for five years you don't have a deal with one of the major publishers, we all know where you can get the the the, the papers. But um, that that money could then be repurposed. I mean, with you know thirty million, I I could build a, a European diamond hub three times over, <laughs> uh, right? I mean, these these are things that are possible. It's just that they need to be organized in such a way that that we all agree that this is a better destination for the money that we need to set up that alternative, and pay for it. So the 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 tie up of indeed of this of this capital is just enormous and it's enormously dis destructive in a way because we have absolutely no say over the way in which that money delivers us the, the knowledge that we produce ourselves. I mean, it's this is madness. Thanks, yeah. Johan, and some some very sound points in there, which I maybe won't get us into because I fear we might go down. Um... Rabbit holes Rabbit if we go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Donna, was there anything that you wanted to add to this though before we move to the to the final question we've got? Uh yeah, but I, I do worry that read and publish deals will hide diamond journals who have been there supporting the community and open for much longer. Um I did want to bring up that positive aspect of um, um New Zealand's a small country and um just a shout out to the we have a fantastic community of academic libraries and people who work in scholarly communications and we support each other. We know each other, these um, eight universities. And um, I've even heard mention of an editor's community of practice which should, for Diamond Journals, um, which would be great to have. Um, also, we've got good leadership from the Council of New Zealand University Librarians um, towards open access. We have lots of projects and I think that's the leadership we need. And But yes, I do think we need um, more. Uh, we need to have some sort of collective around Diamond Open Access. We need to have, I want to put together a directory of New Zealand Diamond Journals, just so I can direct people to a list of them. Um, little things like that. So yeah, Excellent. but definitely to read and publish. Um, let, let's have our diamonds shine out from those as well. And there, there's definitely things happening in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and I might just give a shout out to some colleagues at Auckland who are leading some work, but with colleagues from right across New Zealand around creating an Open Access 101 um, kind of toolkit for our researchers here. So very much localised to, uh, to our context here in Aotearoa, but that should be um, completed by the end of this year and will be licensed under CC BY licence. So I think that'll be a really good resource that people may well want to take and customise for themselves, but helps researchers think about going through the process of publishing um, and, and, and what's right for them, because I think there is something in this about what's the right decision for someone at this stage of their own career as well. Um, and going back to some of what you said, Sean, not, you know, sometimes there's a real tension between having to kind of publish and the place that will give the prestige that someone might need for, you know, from their own career point of view versus, you know, the, their local community and things. And it's a really hard place to be. We've certainly done some work on that at, at Waikato, looking at people's views. But I'll, I'll take us to our, our next question. And Donna, I'm going to start with you, if I may. Um, I, I'm not sure what's happened to Johan, but I'm sure seamlessly he will be invited back onto here. 
Um, I don't think it was anything he said. Um, so Donna, uh, I'm going to just start with you. If you could give us um, your one key piece of advice uh, from your work that would you would give to anyone considering beginning to work on diamond open access journals. Narrowing down to one was very hard, but um, before uh, starting a journal, consider what your long-term goals for the journal are and what the purpose of the journal is and how you're going to make it credible. And when I say credible, um, even if you don't want it to be indexed on any of the sites like DOAD or uh, Directory Open Access Journals or Scopus, so it stands out as not being a predatory journal, so to be um, credible. Um, Long-term goals are important as things happen really slowly and scholarly publishing, and it will take time to grow the journal. It, will, it won't be a Q1 journal straight away, that's for sure. It takes at least two years to get onto Scopus. Um, and also thinking of how you can keep the momentum going for the journal. Um, I've worked with several editors establishing brand new journals, and um, I think it's important to be aware that it's going to be a lot more work on your part than working with a, a publisher. And um, one really good example of this is the proofreading and copy editing process. Um, they're not as easy as you think, and um, you normally don't have funding to pay for a professional. Um, so that's one area. Um, and the journal has to prove itself from the start. So right from the start, look at the um, requirements of Directory of Open Access Journals or Scopus, or Web of Science, or those where you aspire to be, and um, build these into the journal so that um, you have a diverse editorial board, clear aims and scope, clear policies, frequency of publication. And um, so when you do apply to be indexed in the future, you will, you know, most of the work's already done. And also, if again, if you don't want to be indexed, um, there are good ethical guidelines to follow. And finally, if you do want to get indexed, aim for directory of open access journals first. Um, that's the most public mark of credibility, really. Um, but not many diamond journals are on it. So aim for it. Try to get on it. Thanks, Donna. Who'd like to go next? Thanks, Sean. Look, I'm happy to. And I, you know, like Donna, it's hard to narrow it down to one thing. And, you know, I'm thinking about this as an editor of a Diamond Open Access Journal, but I think visibility is a key problem here. And I think we vastly underestimate the number of Diamond Open Access Journals because of their visibility on platforms like um, the Directory of Open Access Journals. One of the key barriers there, the journal has to have a minimum output of five articles a year. And I suspect there's a lot of diamond open access journals that have low output, but perhaps very large size manuscripts. So, but, it, but in terms of the one piece of advice, I mean, I, I, I think it's about relationship building. To make a journal successful, you need the su support of a scholarly community, uh, an editorial board, uh, fellow editors, but you need the support of readers and institutions, uh, perhaps philanthropic funders and colleagues. Uh, but also the technical staff and administrative staff, professional staff of university libraries or other institutions. So, you know, as a as an editor in particular, I think the the burden of establishing and maintaining those relationships is really critical to the long term sustainability and success of a diamond open access journal. And it is exhausting. And I think the kinds of funding mo models and national infrastructure we've been talking about today would really help alleviate some of that burden because I I think a lot of uh, Diamond Open Access Journal editors are reinventing the wheel again and again because they have to navigate these processes independently uh, from very, very different positions. So I think relationships are the core from my point of view. Thanks so much, Sean. Um, Ariana, would you like to go next? Ariana, are you okay to go next? Yes, uh, I think we are having some trouble with the internet. Johan is here in the Redalic building as well. So, um, but yes, I, I would like to say that, for example, we we tried a model in um, in Argentina with uh, the University of La Plata, and 
that the, the guys there uh, made a very interesting uh, model to sustain to sustain diamond up open access in in the institution and it has like three axes a uh, one is uh, the institution in charge of provide technical support i mean uh, there's a, it's a department that it's uh, supporting various journals in the in different technical aspects but there are also different uh, edit, editorial teams and um, journal editors working in their uh, own business. I mean, taking care of peer review and taking care of the community of the uh, peer reviewers and authors and, and, and so on. But also, uh, and this is it, the third uh, axis, is that they uh, align or, or recognize the, this contribution in their own um a research assessment system. So it, it is like a like a, to provide technical services, but also to support the editorial teams and also to provide the policy framework that is needed to to help journals to be recognized. And I think this is a, a good model within an institution that also can be part of a broader model that where uh, infrastructures uh, ha have a role to to help them to be more visible and to be uh, more um, sustainable and more efficient, and and I also I I just want to highlight that Diamond sometimes it is seen that we need to work in a strategy, in top bottom strategy, and not all it's not always like that. We can also work bottom up, and this is how actually Redalic works. Uh, Redalic works with a community of journals, and then. We are scaling because we are fighting from the bottom to to get this recognition. It is also good, of course, to have strategies that that come from the top, from decision makers and governments. But I think we need to to work in the in these both directions in order to get the the system uh, to to get it stronger. Yes. Thank you so much. And and finally, Johan, I'm just checking that you you yes, caught the I, question. Uh, I know you've had a few. Yes, I did. Problems. I did get a question Good. in the in the chat. Uh, Good. Because I mean, my my computer just froze. I I had a problem with my data plan here in Mexico. <laughs> it it suddenly gave out. Um, but um, I agree with everything that has been said. I think also you know policy and so on. But I mean, especially in in uh, uh, the, the, uh, the case of Australia, I think it would be very good to set up a national and a, a national infrastructure for this and, and maybe universities university libraries can pull resources for this for this purpose uh, you know instead of reinventing the wheel uh, in, in every single in, in every single library and and you know I, I really strongly believe in this in this uh, federated network structure you know that a journal should just be doing journal journal level things uh, 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 a diamond capacity center should really do capacity related things, provide a platform, provide services for copy editing and typesetting, provide also legal services in order to uh, make sure that the governance of the journal is there, that the journal is also owned by the community so that it cannot be sold, those, ki those kinds of things, you know, legal advice. Um, so, so, that, so that is really, that is really important. It's, it's, that's the most, yeah, I think that's the advice that, 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 that I would give. Um, Thank you so much, Johan. Um, we have got a few questions and we've still got a few minutes um, as well. So I'll just um, throw the question out there and whoever would like to come in, please do. So I think the, there's, there's been some discussion around um, how we pay for ABCs and how we can change the model. But actually the question that I'm going to ask is a, is a slightly different one because I think it really comes to the heart of some of what you've been talking about, which is how do we centre communities and thinking about how research is shared equitably? So I don't know who might want to, to start with that question. So the question is how to make sure that research do, is shared equitably. So how do we centre communities? So it's much more about communities as opposed to, you know, individuals. Um, so in thinking about how research is shared equitably. Well, if I may, I think, you know, but just by setting up a Diamond Open Access Journal, you're already doing the equitable thing because both authors and readers do not pay for having access to the journal. So that makes it much more accessible for everyone. 
right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that is already a, a, a great thing. Of course, you have to also pay attention to other things of uh, equity, uh, diversity, and 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 and, and, and um, like you know, you have to make sure that you're, the, there's a gender balance on your editorial board. You have to make sure also that you take care of things like multilingualism. That you know, the, the, those things are uh, taken into account. And what we found also in our diamond uh, in, in our diamond study is that those are issues that very typically fall along the wayside because I mean, you know, the journal editors are so busy just. Diamond journal editors are so busy trying to survive that these 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 issues these other issues of equity apart from just access uh, fall by the wayside and this is really something that needs a lot more attention in in the future. So what about um, uh, if we maybe change that question slightly around really how do you how do you start that journal and Donna and Ariana you might want to come in on this um, given given uh, where you are um, but to actually co-design um, you know what that might look like with the community themselves? I think um, the example I gave before of that journal that public republishes in uh, Pacific languages, and the story behind that was lovely. The, um, one of the authors had written a great piece and took it back to his community and they couldn't read it because um, it was in English. And so they created a whole journal to get the info to the community. Um, our, one of our journals is a hospitality journal for pr practitioners, and they included um, professionals in the peer review process um, to involve them in the journal. And they aimed their content at practitioners, a summary, so not full articles. So considering your community when setting up the journal and how they want to, how they'll access that work. You know, if you're targeting busy, time-poor teachers, um, how are you going to get them to read your articles? Um, as we, we've got another journal for aimed at teachers. Um, I think they're big questions, and that's why where diamond journals are good because they can go beyond the boundaries of the traditional setup and say, well, we're just going to write summaries, or it's not going to be in English. Um, so that's one way. Thanks, Donna. And and Kiaka, who was talking about the the journal yesterday from Waikato, um, she. She talked about the does it pass the firewood test? So basically, are they gonna are you gonna write something and they're just gonna put it on a fire to to burn because it's it's useless to them? Or actually are they gonna keep that because it's really meaningful? Which I I've, I've kept that visual in my head. <laughs> it's quite a good one. Um there were there were also some questions uh, around the cost of publishing being quite a barrier particularly for those who aren't necessarily affiliated to, say, a university. So maybe they're in a hospital or they're an independent uh, researcher. Um, and, and I guess, you know, thoughts about what maybe we can do a, around this. I think, um, I'll be honest, even uh, researchers within the an institution, a university institution, quite often can't afford to pay an APC charge. Here at Waikato, like some others, we've set up an open access equity fund to be able to either co-fund or fund uh, those APCs or BPC charges. But um, anyone got any ideas? We'll just take maybe one or two. I suppose they don't have, yeah. have repositories because um, I always say go green if you can't afford the APC. Yeah. Or you can't, but um, yeah, use use the what we call the rights retention strategy uh, at at coalition. It's, this is something that in in the UK has been adopted by a lot of institutions. More than twenty now have adopted the rights retention strategy. That really is basically says that the, the the authors at the institution must retain the rights on their um, on their publications, and that allows them to deposit a copy of the author accepted manuscript in a repository. Now, of course, commercial publishers hate this with their hatiest hate, but there's very little they can do about it. Um, I mean, they are fighting back. I have to say. I mean, like ACS has introduced some policies. We can discuss that, if need be. But I really think that Australia would do well to follow the example of the UK here um, uh, in 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 instituting institutional rights retention uh, policies, which protect the researcher in claiming that CC by on the on the article in order to be able to deposit that article in a repository. Thank you, Johan, and great suggestion there. And Fiona, UNSW has pointed out that both UNSW and QUT 
already have rights protection policies in place in Australia. We, we currently don't have anyone with one of those in Aotearoa, New Zealand, but I'm sure that that might be what we work towards next. So we are at the end of our time. Um, it's one minute to three, and we're going to go for a break in a minute. I'd just like to say namahi nui, or thank you to all of our panellists. Um, it's been a really, really engaging discussion. Uh, thank you to those that are here that have asked questions as well. I think really my big takeaways, I think, are around the, the relationships being at the heart as, as well as our communities. Um, and thank you for, for sharing those thoughts on that. Um, how we can look to other places for what they've done um, globally. There's so much inspiration for all of us um, to really make sure that, as Sean, you, you put it at the start, that you know, these aren't these don't come become vulnerable and that actually there's a plan for the long-term preservation of these diamond journals. So a huge thank you. Um, I'm hoping that we'll see some national infrastructure come into being, Johan. Um, nothing like some optimism. Um, so thank you all very much. Um, I'm going to now I think there'll be a slide come up to say that we're having a break before we go into to part two. So everyone, please get up and have a stretch. Um, do whatever you need to do. Um, and uh, you'll be greeted by um, Dimity, I think, for the, the next half of today's session. So thank you all very much. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. See you.
think we'll be starting soon. I'm just waiting to see if the slide changes to, to part two. There we go. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dimity Flanagan. I am on the Executive Committee for Open Access Australasia. I'm also Acting Associate Director, Research Information and Engagement at the University of Melbourne. And it is my pleasure to chair part two of today's session, which is Shine on Diamond Journals, making sure they're forever. And this is the interactive portion of uh, today's session, which is going to involve some breakout rooms, uh, which will be facilitated uh, by our new lovely panel, uh, who I will introduce now. So uh, first up, we have David Nichols. He is the Associate Professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Waikato. He conducts research into how people interact with information, including both usability and scholarly communication. And David will be uh, facilitating our breakout session on discoverability. Uh, so welcome, David. Next, we have Tracy Cray, Journal Manager, Academic Journals in the Office for Scholarly Communication at the Queensland University of Technology. Uh, Tracy is responsible for three of QUT's open access peer-reviewed scholarly publications and oversees the life cycle of all issues. And Tracy will be chairing our infrastructure um, breakout session. And finally, we have Helen Chan, Manager of Open Scholarship and Copyright at UTS Library. Um, Helen's department manages UTS ePress, a diamond open access publisher of monographs, journals, and textbooks. And Helen will be overseeing the breakout session on credibility. Uh, so we have three breakout sessions. Everyone will be randomly assigned to one of these three rooms. Now there'll be a jam board for each room, um, which all participants are encouraged to write on, even if you don't have a chance to, to share your ideas because it's such a lively discussion, make sure you do just put everything on the Jamboard because we will be looking at these after the session to see how we can go forward as a community in supporting open access Diamond Journals. Um, our facilitators will have that Jamboard up on the screen. So we'll be drawing on the different ideas that are mentioned to discuss those further. Then we are going to come back as a group. So we have around half an hour in the breakout sessions. We'll come back as a group. Now, originally this session was planned for a whole two and a half hours. We're gonna see if maybe we can just do it in two hours. We're really aware that everyone's busy. So we'll hopefully be finishing up in 52 minutes. We'll see how we go. So we do wanna have um, a focus on, you know, what we might wanna do as a community in terms of next steps to support these different areas of Diamond Journal. So keep that in mind that when we come back, we do wanna really have it sort of action and future focused. Um, so I think I'm going to hopefully just see everything now work seamlessly in terms of getting us into our breakout rooms. And then we'll come back and David and Tracy and Helen will have a great chat about all the good ideas we're, we're discussing now. Okay, I see something coming up on the screen. So everything seems to be work. Waiting for everyone to get back into the room. Uh, do we think we have everyone? I think everyone's been kicked out, so they should be. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, do. I feel like I'm missing Helen on my screen, at least. Yeah. Uh, yes, I was just looking for her too. I think she dropped out of group three. So okay. I'm not sure where she is. 
Um, okay. Uh, for if, if Helen doesn't pop back in, then someone from group three, <laughs> you, you might be called upon. Um, so I hope everyone enjoyed the chance to, to chat with colleagues from across Australasia. Um, I know I did. I almost forgot that I was chairing a session when we came back because I was so involved in the breakout room. Um, so I thought we could just, if, you know, if everyone will go around, give a quick summary um, of sort of the key takeaways from the breakout session and really thinking about that, that last slide, what are the really key priorities and what we might be able to think of actions we can take as a community. Um, I'll start, I'll go in the order of the breakout room. So I'll start with you, David. Okay, so yes, we were discoverability uh, once we were all in the right room. Um, uh, so uh, we kind of came to, I think, uh, yeah, three-ish kind of broad themes. Um, one was, uh, very much a kind of people-centric community sort of emphasis of saying that to be a successful kind of diamond or indeed open access journal, you need to be very visible, present in the particular research communities. You need to kind of identify advocates and um, uh, kind of researchers, uh, people who are going to be on your editorial boards and use them as... Uh, a kind of uh, a human uh, kind of discoverability channel, I guess. Uh, and Michael. then the, uh, the the main sort of um, uh, thinking around how people actually discover content was, you know, not unsurprisingly that, although we don't actually have an exact number, but, you know, we think... A, the overwhelming percentage of, of content is probably discovered by a Google Scholar um, and, you know, some other similar services. And so that means that uh, you have to have a strong focus on, uh, on metadata, on your embedded metadata, and also kind of thinking through different publishing formats. So not everything just in PDF, you know, but web native formats or even EPUB. Um, but ensuring that's a kind of um, important focus. And uh, and I think beyond that, probably just checking that it's being done correctly. So, uh, and that's a continual checking. So you kind of, yes, you get your stuff indexed, but then you kind of need to go back every few months and make sure that all of the, the background systems that are doing the harvesting and uh, creating the discoverability in effect, um, are actually still going to be live and working. And then uh, the third point was, um, the third theme maybe, was kind of just being a bit more technical and saying that you know, some of these aspects of discoverability and other services like Google Scholar are driven just by underlying interoperability. So people were just saying, yeah, the things you know everyone would expect, DOIs, ORCIDs, Crossref, making sure all of this stuff kind of um, kind of works well, and uh, and that your journal is kind of participating in these uh, systems, especially because uh, you know it, it's also kind of almost more thematically coherent because these are you know not commercial systems. You know, Orchid is not a commercial thing, even though it's some, it has some commercial publishers as members and contributors. So. Those were kind of the three themes then. There was a um, uh, focus on kind of human community aspects, um, the centrality of Google Scholar and other kind of things, and making sure that you participate in the kind of digital ecosystem through uh, through things like DOIs, ORCIDs, and Crossref. Great. Thanks, David. I really like the human discoverability chart. I think, I think that should be a term we all start using. Um, with the emphasis on Google Scholar, the importance of metadata, DOIs and ORCIDs, I think that is a great transition across to Tracy and infrastructure. Oh, great, Dimitri. Thanks, 
David, there's a, there was quite a lot of crossover. So we looked at um, what was essential in terms of infrastructure, and we took a really holistic approach to what infrastructure might look like. So we thought about the technical aspects, we talked about the people, and we also talked about the skills that are required around uh, setting up a journal. Um, and so in terms of technical, what sort of platforms, what sort of software, in terms of people, um, that, and that was really at the core of what we were thinking about. We, we had things like academic champions, um, bringing together a community of practice that included people that were involved in the journal, um, sort of, and, you know, considering all the institutional knowledge and drawing that in. Uh, and the skills, so the skills would cover things, um, I guess the most obvious is, is the technical skills and the people that would support the journal technically, um, but also um, support from, say, our library staff in terms of indexing DOIs, um, all the things that, that David talked about too. Then we thought more broadly about what what a business model for a diamond journal might look like in terms of future sustainability and long-term sustainability. Um, we discussed um, financial support and where would that come from because um, we know that technically diamond open access is free, but they're not free to, to run. Um, so we looked at sort of the, the value of long-term funding and that might come from policy, um, and practice in terms of what your institution has a, around and what they say, or verbalise around what open access means. Uh, and bringing in what, one thing that was really important we, we thought was succession planning. Um, so having a bit of a plan around what happens if editors leave, what happens if journal managers leave, what happens when your tech people disappear, um, preservation policies for the, for the whatever you're publishing, that was really important. So that long-term view, and, and I think the crux of that was leadership in some sense around how this would all be brought together. And finally, we, we, we attempted to bring together the top three priorities. I think we came up with really four. So obviously one of them um, was the long-term term funding to support this who was supported um, and that might come from um, having some sort of a supportive policy environment or rewards and incentives around open access. Um, at the centre of those, those priorities are the people, so we need champions, not just academic champions who are our editors but also our professional staff champions in terms of tech support, um, library people for example, um, and I guess uh, Another priority is that technical capacity. Um, and um, I think Max Sullivan said it really well in terms of interoperability. So um, the value of having all those different discovery lay layers and what, and what that looks like. Um, so that pretty much sums it up. Um, and thanks to Dimity for doing all that, that work with the, the sticky notes. Uh, thanks, Tracy. And I think... Um... If, if you look at all that, you realise, wow, a lot goes into it. And I think, you know, with that succession planning, I think people being realistic about, about the task ahead, for sure, like they get a big, the, that full picture of what is entailed when you sign up to, to run a, a Diamond Open Access Journal, um, but also the rewards you get when you run it. Um, so Helen, I'm not sure is in the room I don't want to put anyone on the spot um i, I can report you... back if you like i've got you, uh, I'm looking at the the jam board i'm not sure how many in our room are, are looking at it right now but chime in if i don't represent it um fully of course and we had a really good discussion actually so um what does credibility mean um we had a very full Jamboard for that, and it kind of came down trying to summarize. First of all, um, we've got the whole idea of um, where is it indexed? Is it in DOAJ? Is it indexed in the commercial places like Scopus? Um, we recognize that there's a link between credibility and discoverability there. 
And we also thought having robust and appropriate policies and governance and transparency was really important for credibility, uh, having things like a preprints policy, um, having it very clear on the website that there is an editorial board of experts, um, having a professional look, uh, showing membership in, in COPE, for example, or, or um, again, transparency about those kinds of aspects. Um, having the editors clearly listed and clear and transparent processes. I'm um, just trying to summarize through the notes. I think that was probably summarized most of it. Um, we then talked about what the, were the main credibility problems. And here we've got the, well, we have start off with a, a couple of things. We've got the culture that prestige is linked to traditional metrics and the old time perception of open access being associated with predatory publishing. Um, the difficulty or the time it takes to get indexed in the kind of commercial indexes where people will go first and foremost to look at it, you know, the credibility of a journal. Um, how, we, the need to have national organizations championing and supporting diamond open access um, and allied to that, obviously a national infrastructure would be really helpful. Um, what else have we got here? Oh, we recognize that there's a difference between what authors require for credibility and what maybe people on the journal side, like editors and managing editors and so on, would require. So researchers and authors may just be interested in the prestige amongst their colleagues or their research circle. Um, but on the journal, running the journal side, we would be more interested in, you know, does this journal have a PID and that kind of back-end linked in stuff. Um, reliability of funding obviously was talked about a lot in the panel and that's a really big one. Um, attracting quality papers is a challenge. I think it was Donna that was saying there's this vicious cycle of you have to be discovered in order to attract authors, but in order to attract authors and quality papers, you already have to have the reputation. So that kind of um, cycle getting out of that. And um, moving on to our top three, we had um, a, a number of points that could be summarized into one priority, which is to do with the look, looking professional, the design, the features, and being plugged in to the scholarly ecosystem to the same extent as the commercial journals. Um, we also said a top priority is, again, it was touched on in the panel earlier, promote the positives as much as possible. And the th our third one was transparent, robust, comprehensive policies and procedures. So that was our three. Thanks, Jenna. Um, so in terms of yes, next steps and, and also what we want the message to be um, taking back to the, the meeting around Diamond Open Access Journals in Mexico, um, I think we've done, uh, we've had a lot of good discussion around, around what is required. And I think, um, Perhaps if you're at an institution that already supports Diamond Open Access Journals, um, you ha already have good communities of practice and, uh, and a lot of knowledge. And I think there's definitely a question there about how we can you know, support the institutions that, or even the academics that don't feel like they have any institutional support and that are out there in the wild, like how we might be able to support them as well um, when they're not getting that institutional support. Um, I know there's been discussion for a while now about how we could have a national or, or regional community of practice so that we can we can draw on all the knowledge that um, we have in this community so that that academics can can feel supported or even um, 
scholarly comms librarians like myself to continue that lobbying piece in their own institution for more support of journals. It's it's always so inspiring to hear about what others are doing. Um, so I think as well as the, the national infrastructure in terms of technology, it's also making it more of a network in terms of people, I think would be extremely helpful. Um, you know, anyone from our panel have um, sort of thoughts about what they've talked about, how they could make it a, a more concrete next step sort of action? Well, there's just one extra that kind of uh, adds to what you were just saying, I think, is that a lot of the discussion, both in the kind of panel earlier and at least in, in our room, I think, was we, we kind of, I think maybe because of the um, the population of people who are here, we kind of almost default to the diamond uh, journals which are associated with institutions like universities. And there's a kind of group of them out there, often kind of like small little societies, which aren't really associated with institutions. And so something that's, you know, yes, we do things within our universities or within our groups of universities, and we kind of just miss out on some of these other journals. So I think we kind of, we should always kind of remember that the you know university associated journals are not the total population of open access diamond journals so i think there's you know whenever we think about is there some sort of national or, or regional type um approach that you know that w it doesn't ha or it shouldn't be solely based on academic institutions yeah and how, how do we how do we get to these these editorial boards or editors in chief to sort of loop them into discussions as well. Um, I don't know, it's a sort of feasibility around around having sort of directories around these things, whether they're informal or not. Diamond yeah. Constellation, that is beautiful, Kim. I think I was thinking about what Donna said in the panel discussion about she was um, putting together a, a list of New Zealand uh, Diamond Open Access. And I think that's something we could do in Australia as well, and that maybe that's a way of uh, getting a sense of who's doing what and then bringing them together if, if they want to in some sort of community. That, um, because I think you're right, like we have a, the security blanket of an institution for the for the journals here at QUT, but yeah, there are there are organisations that are, are publishing journals, open access journals as well. So I think I think I'd like to follow Donna's lead and maybe we do something for Australia as well, and then come together as Australasia, um, so we can get a sense of what. I mean, I I know that with the survey, the Diamond Ac Open Access Survey in twenty twenty one. Um, we, we responded to that, but I'm sure there was a lot of people who, who didn't that are, that are publishing Diamond Open Access. So there was a, a survey of kind of pretty much all Australian journals. I've just put it into the, the chat um, just uh, last year. So I thought should, con I think that had open access as one of its features of analysis. So I think um, that actually does contain a list of, well, like a, a good approximation to all the open access journals um, in some way associated with Australia. Well, that's wonderful that someone has has done the hard work <laughs> and um, now we can see whether, yeah, they're interested in having some sort of community of practice, longer sort of discussion around what we could be doing nationally, regionally to, to support them. Um, and also just sharing sharing the knowledge and skills needed to to ensure that they can can continue longer term. Um, Ginny, I know you wanted to wrap this up a bit earlier, if possible. So it's five past the hour. Um, but do you feel we have some robust next steps? Um, is there anything else you wanted to talk about? No, I think we've got a great set of things here and I feel like um, we'll leave this Google Doc open so you're more than welcome to add to it. But um, I'm actually going to be speaking tomorrow at the wrap up of the Diamond Open Access session in Mexico. And what they want to have coming back from that is the, um, uh, the what, what what our our kind of messages are from, from here. So if you've got anything you want me to be thinking about, please just put it on there and I'll, I'll make sure it gets some um, gets. Um, kind of put forward 
And before we finish, can I, Dimitri, you might have been going to do this, but can I just flag the organiser of this, which particularly Garth Smith, who wasn't able to be here, who did so much hard work and was not here. Um, Donna Coventry, Janet Catron and myself were involved in organising this particular session. But uh, yeah, thanks to everyone who brought this together. Yes, thank you. I quickly put my hand up to want to chair this session because I thought it would be it would be so interesting. And I must admit, it's really lit a fire in my brain for like, you know, continuing this national conversation around how we can support infrastructure. I think, you know, we're starting to move nationally in the OE sp OER space around having that that sort of community infrastructure access and how we might be able to do that on the journal side, I think is a, it's a really important conversation um, and looking forward to discussing it more in our community forums. I do wanna do a quick plug for tomorrow's session. Um, and I will just put the Zoom link in the chat. So tomorrow's session is uh, creating space for indigenous and Pacific research. Um, I know in Australia, that would be a very important conversation right now. Um, I think everyone is still grappling with the uh, results of the referendum. And I think to continue to discuss how we can make sure that there are important forums for an ind Indigenous voice is very important. So I do encourage you to go to tomorrow's session. I want to thank everyone who contributed to this session. So not only our amazing breakout session wranglers of Tracy, David, um, Helen, slash Janet, thank you, Janet, for stepping up, um, but also everyone who stayed around to have a conversation, because um, that's what makes breakout sessions so valuable. Um, and of course, thank you to our panel from the first half of the session as well. That was really, really interesting and engaging. Um, Everyone, continue to have a wonderful open access week. Um, and thank you again for joining us. Goodbye.